Hello and welcome to Bourbon Barrel Talk. I'm your host, Scott Minton. Today we are at Old 55 Distillery here in uh, northern slash central Indiana, I guess. West, Northwest. West central. West central. I'd say yeah. west central. I'll yeah. take whatever you got for me, Jason. Exactly. Somewhere in Indiana. We're yeah. here with uh, the proprietor and master distiller, um, Mr. Jason Fruits. How are we doing today, Jason? We are good. Master distiller is a stretch. We'll just go with distiller and, you know, yeah. Stumble, fake it till you make it. Is that what we were talking about? <laughs> yeah, we, that's exactly what we were saying. So, um, and uh, with me on the panel today, we got uh, Mr. Uh, Toby Hatfield, and we hey. have uh, Dave Mall, which is a new voice to the to the team. Thanks, excited yeah. to be here. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Jason, hey, many of our listeners might not be familiar with Old Fifty Five. Can you give us an overview um, about Old Fifty Five and tell us a little bit about? some of your signature products and the mash bill that goes into that. Absolutely. So, uh, we are a family farm to bottle, uh, estate, uh, distiller, bourbon producer. Bourbon is always the concentration. Um, we do make some other products, but bourbon is always what we were going after. Uh, so we farm this six miles down the road on my grandpa's farm, mill it, mash it, ferment it, distill it, barrel age it. We've never sourced any product. Everything comes from us. Um, so if you bought anything from old 55, it came from my family, Uh, right here in uh, Newtown, Indiana. So pretty cool. Uh, So we've been distilling for over six years now. Uh, Just the family and I, nobody but family, siblings, and my dad work here. Um, It's pretty crazy. Just got to kind of show you guys around. It was pretty cool. And uh, we, um, yeah, pretty, pretty fun. So we're probably best known internationally for our sweet corn bourbon which is what we all just tried um totally different uh, 100 percent corn mash bill the difference is it is um instead of being uh um regular field corn this is corn on the cob sweet corn so uh super cool stuff very different i call it dessert bourbon or corn brandy it's it, it's delicious but uh it's uh that's probably what we're best known for and then uh we just were joking too uh, when you own a distillery with your dad and your dad does not drink um you get to make everything you like so you guys are pouring our brand new bottled and bond uh single barrel bourbon and this is our weeded bourbon mash bill so this is 80 percent corn 20 percent soft red winter wheat all once again from the family farm estate estate made and farmed and uh th- this is pretty cool so this is what i've been waiting six years to get to is bottle and bond we we, we sold a little too much to start out with, and now we've moved on, and uh, this is just awesome. So this is, um, and we will get to you. You guys said you guys got a uh, barrel pick of ours from... Uh, um, Total Wine. Total Wine. That is the same mash bill as this, just at cast strength, and we have another... Um, you know, basically another variety of this up here as well. That's my favorite. The cast strength is always my favorite. Sure. But this bottled and bond is taking over for this 80 proof bottle. Um, and uh, we'll basically, everything's going to go bonded now. Does that make sense? So that's sure. Yeah. That's, this is our, you can find it anywhere in the Midwest is our hopes here in the next year or two. So, so your mash bill is pretty much consistent. It's the 80, 20 you were talking about. Yep. So yep. is there a reason why you varied from what most distillers do with the uh, malted barley? Absolutely. So um, we got into this a little bit, but it's um, so my first two estate grains we had available from the family farm were corn and wheat. And we were going to, so we use uh, six enzymes for proprietary yeast. And uh, um, as I was going around talking to consultants, other distillers, people that I respect in the business, I was like, hey, this is what I got. And they're like, make some. And I was like, okay. They're like, just run the equipment, man. Just distill some stuff. And I was like, all right. And we were, we had, barley in the ground but it wasn't it was you know i mean we had basically it was overwintered we were in the middle of the winter so i had to come up we didn't even know if we were going to have it come out yet uh if it was going to actually produce anything because the overwintered barley here can be interesting you know what i mean like sure. it's either really good or you have nothing because there's a late frost or something so uh, we were waiting on that and uh to that point i knew i was going to enzyme these anyway so if we think about these you know, these mash bills that have these traditional malted, you know, five to 8% malted barley in them. A lot of them aren't even malted anymore. You know, I mean, they're just putting barley in, which is totally like, I, I'd, I'd laugh. Like it's, it's not even the same. Like those are like two different animals. You know, I mean, a malted barley and, and a regular barley are totally separate and malted barley is expensive. And we use that for that, you know, 
that semi-amyl enzyme that helps us break down those mash bills. That's how we traditionally did it. Well, it's 2020. I don't have to do that. I have enzymes and, you know, I mean, we have a much more efficient way to do that. And any distiller that tells you they're not using enzymes to efficiently push things forward is full of it. You know what I mean? There are some guys that do all traditional, which is awesome, but I mean, they will admit to you that uh, enzymatic process today with the, what we have available is incredible. You know what I mean? And we want efficiency. We want to make the best product we possibly can. Right. Um, one of the, one of the cool things that you kind of mentioned and you're, I think the fourth pre fourth person that we've interviewed that is a, a sweet mash bill. Mm-hmm. So basically you don't have to, you know, do the reuse on the sour mash. Um, tell us how that helps with, with distilling a, a quality product and a more consistent product. Um, and the farm to table aspect that brings you to that product. Absolutely. So a lot of these guys are sour mashing because um, they run continuous stills. So in the process of all this efficiency that they're trying to create, which is awesome and incredible to watch and see, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Sour mashing is just a natural part of that. Um, Where you're seeing a lot of us younger guys uh, do this sweet mashing is because we get more consistency and then we're doing, like I always say, we're really large, small batch, you know what I mean? So I have to clean every fermentation tank out every day in between. Uh, We're starting with fresh water. It's just a more... I, I can control everything that is going into that mash tank, and that's what's important to me. So sure. I know the yeast. I know what the inputs are. Uh, spent stillage off of is not always consistent, and that's I don't want to deal with it. So that that is something that just helps me immediately. I understand the process and why. You know, I always, I always say this. If it was 100 years ago and the four of us were mashing some whiskey today, we'd be sour mashing because one of us is cutting firewood all day to keep up because sweet mashing is just the inputs are higher. You know, more temperature, mm-hmm. more. That's all those things. So um, sour mashing is – there. It's, just, it's tomato, tomato. You know what I mean? I think there's benefits to both. Um, it's just something we chose in the process and what we do, and it helps us, once again, in our efficiency because that's all. I'm keeping such a small part of that heart cut. I need that heart cut to be as big as I can possibly make it, and sweet mashing lets me be consistent and do that. Gotcha. So you mentioned um, back when we were talking, um, part of the reason you got started doing the the pod, or the uh, distilling in general so tell us a story about i mean you're you're 20 years old you're you're gonna go to you're in college or whatever how did how did you actually get to this point so first of all i appreciate you guys driving to the middle of nowhere west central indiana to newtown uh uh, and i told you guys this earlier if you would have told me in my late teens early 20s and i'd be back in newtown indiana i'd punch in the mouth i was never coming back anyone (laughs) that knows me knew that i was running away from here as fast as possible so About 30 minutes north of here is West Lafayette. That's uh, Purdue's campus. My mom went to Purdue. She just wanted one of her kids to go to Purdue, and I um, was a pretty good student. So I got into Purdue um, and and loved it up there. Um, uh, Go Boilers. And we, um, you know, I was running as fast as I possibly could from here, and I laughed so Fast forward to 2009, 2010, my dad's bugging me about diversifying from the family business. So my family owns grain elevators. We're like the middleman for farming. Uh, So we uh, own another grain elevator in Stone Bluff, which is about uh, 10 minutes away. And uh, middleman for farmers, we commoditize grain. And uh, just, you know, no interest in coming back. And fast forward, it's 2020, and I'm here seven days a week, and we're making bourbon, and I own a distillery with my dad, and my dad's never had a sip of beer or liquor in his life. It's pretty funny. So, yeah. so one of the things that we started back in March is Scott and I was talking around saying, let's do a bourbon barrel bracket, or a bourbon bracket, where we're going to list and seed all the bourbons like, like a March Madness bracket. And we, we, had, has, we had already scheduled this podcast, but because of COVID, it got delayed. Exactly. Well before that. And we were like, okay, we, we liked 055. Um, I think that um, one of us, I can't remember which one was talking about it, was like, well, they, they, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller brand. It's a craft distillery. We still got to have it in the field. Uh, we, we don't know where it should be seated. We're trying to figure it all out. And we decided to put old 55 in the field and it's like a 15 seed thinking they're going to go out in the first round or two because not a whole lot of people know who they are. Of course. And, yep. and, and we go through the process and we're, we're going through all these different bourbons and, and, and seeding them all with the, the Pappy 23s and the, the Eagle Rare 17s and all that kind of stuff and thinking, okay, well, we're going to put these in there. We don't know how it's going to land. 
But for whatever reason, the folks here at 055 got out and voted. And we had a huge following and brought us all the way to the end of the, the championship. And we wouldn't have expected it. We, we didn't think of what, – what do you think drove that? Um, I, I'll tell you, we didn't – expected either who, who did you guys have us in the first round it was william larue weller right i think so i think it was william Pro- LaRue weller. probably literally my favorite like other than what i make favorite weeded bourbon on the planet right, right. and i'm like are, are you kidding me guys like you have to <laughs> you know put me up against you know michael jordan and, the, and we won and i was like oh that's hilarious i'm good like we're good we want you know I, that, that's, I i don't need anything else we that's the biggest upset of all time and uh you know, it's cool with uh, it's cool what social media um, love it and hate it, uh, what it's capable of doing, and we have some just really uh, awesome uh, patrons and customers, and and they got out and we would post up, hey, we we made it to the next round, go out and vote again, and they they did it, they just voted like crazy, and 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 we won the whole thing. You guys, uh, thank you very much. That barrel head is stinking gorgeous. I will put something up today on social media that is freaking cool. That that will get posted in here somewhere. We love it, and uh, yeah, it was just fun. It was a lot of fun, especially with the COVID and the, like, we talked about that the tournament being canceled. We're big mm. basketball people anyway, and you know it was it was uh, it was awesome. I mean, so. you can't be in Central. Indiana not be a big basketball well, fan. Exactly. I mean, there's a gymnasium that we store our barrels and all the all the barrels that we just showed you are underneath a high school gymnasium. You know what I mean? That both of my grandpas played high school basketball and it's pretty cool. Go ahead and tell us that story because when when we drove up, I was looking back in the back and I'm like, that says it looks like a school back there. Oh yeah. And we, we saw the name of the school and we're like, wow, that's that's different. And of course, the front facade is different, and it looks like a different building. But explain how you came across this building and what made you decide to put the distillery here. So this building has been here since 1902. Um, I grew up, like I told you guys, a hundred yards down the road, and uh, my parents still live there to this day. And uh, this fell in. Uh, this facility fell in in uh, 19, like I want to say 88. It basically totally fell in. And we uh, we basically saw, I mean, it was just like everything. Uh, I joke, like, so the, the county was trying to sell this to uh, my dad for a uh, dollar to get, get rid of the liability. And we basically had... Um, uh, Dad, I mean, Dad had no interest. So in 2009, we renovated this facility. I always joke that we, uh, we, uh, he, you know, the the county was worried about some kid falling in here and dying, and it probably was going to be me. You know, I mean, because we were out here crawling around in it. You know, I mean, it was just jagged metal everywhere. It was just a mess. So Dad renovated it in 2009. No intent of putting a distillery in here at all. And uh, um, here we are. So the front end with the brick building we couldn't save. Uh, so that we're still on the foundation of that. That is where the um, the still itself, our our grains are all the, the production floor. And then on the back half was built on in 1942. That was a WPA work project from World War II. Uh, there's a gymnasium and a basement. The gymnasium, both of my grandpas played high school basketball in. It's super cool. And then we store all of our barrels underneath that gymnasium in a basement. We're the only North American distillery that ages everything underground, all of our bourbon underground, which is a very cool. We get to go down there and check it out. It's just a neat, neat, uh, neat facility that has a lot of history and a lot of, you know, just – yeah, legacy in it. It's just fun. Super cool. Yeah, if if I owned this location, I would have had to turn that gymnasium back into a basketball floor. I would have had to, my kids to be playing in there. Oh, and, yeah, we played basketball. We played basketball in there. Uh, my brother, my little brother, uh, cleaned up the floor. This is a cool story that I didn't tell you guys earlier. My little brother drove the Bobcat, just a skid loader, and scraped up the floor because it, it was run like rain. And the whole roof was caved in. There was no. And we sent a five foot section of that is at the Indiana High School Basketball Hall of Fame. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And the north. In, uh, basketball goal is at the high school basketball hall of fame as well and we just uh you know he aaron was like dude it was like destroying a piece of artwork because my grandpa told me when they did this in 1942 they had over 30 dudes that hand like hand tiled and um basically put down every piece of the uh basketball floor so it was perfectly level because mm. those wpa projects it was just about putting people to work does that make sense sure. it didn't matter how long it took or what it cost it was just like just do it and employ as many people as you can to keep people busy so i mean it was literally i mean aaron was like dude i was almost in tears scraping this thing up but we we had to scrape it up and we poured fresh concrete over the top of it to make it smooth so we can move skids on it and use it as a warehouse and yeah yeah but we've played basketball in there it's pretty cool i always love to tell the story of my my grandpa lowell which is my mom's side uh i've had multiple people that played basketball 
people in that gym because this was his home. He went to school here. My grandma and grandpa here in town both just went to Richland Township here. And they would say if they couldn't get my grandpa a little mad in a game and foul like two or three guys out on him, like you couldn't beat Richland Township because my grandpa was that good of a basketball player. <laughs> so there is supposedly a, a paper somewhere. So he dunked the ball. Uh, and they gave this was when it was one point, and they gave the other team one point because it was illegal. You couldn't go, you know, couldn't put the ball in the hoop. So there's paper somewhere that it, it, I need to find that and post it up here. But pretty cool. That'd story. be great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. So Kentucky distillers typically make a big deal about you know the water source, mm-hmm. you know, um, limestone water, all those type of things. Of course. What do you guys use for water here, and and, and how does that impact? The, we import the- all of our water from China. And it, no, I'm just telling totally you. So. No, in water, my, my jaw just like hit the mic. <laughs> no, so water is a, and they are absolutely correct. Water is a huge deal. Okay, uh, but what they don't and what they oversell is so the Taze River is an aquifer that runs from Joliet, Illinois, to the Smoky Mountains, and it runs right through Louisville through Tennessee. We're all in the same water source. Uh, all of that limestone is closest to the ground in Southern Indiana. That's why the Empire State Building and the Washington Monument and all that limestone came from southern indiana okay so we have great water here we have the same water that they're using in kentucky uh, it's all well water we use well water here uh we're i told you guys we're completely free and open we are owe it for so uh all of our distillation water is just straight well water we don't treat it at all but we do ro reverse osmosis the water that we cut barrels with because well water will change seasonally and i need consistency so we ro it through that system so anything that goes into a barrel or when we cut it after it comes out of the barrel is our road but it's our well water here but that's the only thing we do to the water uh, during the distillation process all that is literally straight water out of the well we use we don't treat it in any way shape or form cool cool um how important is it to o55 to know exactly where the corn and the grain comes from i'm mean, being farm to table i mean that gives you a huge advantage i gotta fill in my in my mind well, so I say this is what separates my family, and, and this is not about me. Um, uh, old 55 is about my family. It's, it's the sacrifices that my grandparents made to get us here, uh, my parents to get us here, um, and then my siblings now and us and, and myself working our butts off. So uh, the corn and, and that estate grain is what we do. My family does corn. That's what we've done for 52-plus years now. Uh, we source corn all over the country we we are the middleman for farming so knowing the what we know about corn it only made sense to you know i mean like well bourbon's made from corn man that would be cool you know i mean that was the, that was always the idea i mean we we hold millions of bushels up here i always joke they're like so do you use all of that i'm like if we used all of the corn that we have at the grain elevator that's what 300 yards that way um we would be on my private island right now. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> chatting with girls in bikinis, running around us, serving us, pouring these drinks for us. You know what I mean? So it is. Um, uh, it would be almost impossible to use. I mean, no, dis- no distiller on the planet uses as much corn as we have out there. I mean, that's how many millions and millions of bushels we have out there. So um, pretty cool that way. But corn is super important. And, and to that fact, I mean, we have minimums on test weight. Like all these things. I, I joke all the time. The sweet corn is a perfect example. Like... You know, I'll go and talk to other distillers, and I, I could bring a bag of dirt off my floor and say, hey, this is milled sweet corn, and they would fight over it. And then to go home and try to distill it, and they'd be like, dude, I can't get a Brax test. Like, nothing is working. And I'd be like, yeah, that's dirt off my floor. That's I always tell distillers, I'm like, you need to trust who you're sourcing grain. I am spoiled rotten, and that the grain comes – that is what we do. You know what I mean? But if, for all these guys that are sourcing grain, you know uh, – put distiller on anything and everybody's price goes to four times what it was before, you know, and I always, that's one thing my family has been trying to push for. So I get the best. So a lot of times I feel like most grain sourcing is they give you the worst and you're going to pay the most for it because they know you'll fall for it. Cause you're going to have to mill it for them anyway. Well, we do all the milling here on site anyway, and we have minimums on test weight. So I get, I get the choicest, the best of everything. Cause we're in the best area to do that. And that's just once again, being spoiled and having this awesome, you know, all these logistics that kind of fell right into my lap. One of the, um, things that you you talked about is being you you work with this with it's all family members it's your father um there's got to be times where you guys don't agree on things and um there's been troubles starting the distillery figuring out which what the bottle shape is going to be or what the label is going to look like how how has that been to actually start a brand new brand in which um, you're basically doing it from scratch with people that, that aren't afraid to tell you what they really think. Well, 
I will say this, that, um, you know, working with my siblings is, is awesome. I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, Ashley, my little sister that's floating around in here somewhere. Uh, my little brother, Aaron, that's my right hand man, my best buddy. Uh, my older brother, Chris, like we, you know, there's definitely some personalities there, but we grew up super close. And this is once again, credit to my parents. Like we all grew up remarkably close to each other anyway. And we are vastly different in personality, but, uh, we do a good job. Now I always jokingly and and if any of my siblings were in here with me right now, they would, they would chuckle about this. But, um, I always say we're kind of like, uh, rule, you know, family ruled by committee. I'm just like Stalin. And if you make me mad, you go to the gulag. So I'm just kind of a bull in the China shop. They always have to deal with me. So, um, but we, uh, we do a really good job of, uh, you know, dad is, uh, you know, the cool thing is, is when, and, and we all feel this way about our dad. Um, you know, my grandparents sacrificed, I mean, we come from nothing. Like there's, we come from absolutely nothing. It's just hard work. This is the, this is the all American story right here. And my dad is just the next one. And now he's letting us do this on the legacy scale. And when you work for the guy that you love and respect most on the planet, like failure is not an option. You know what I mean? And that's how we all feel. And that's, it, it's, it's pretty cool, man. It's, there's nothing like it. So being a craft distiller and, and being in Indiana, you know, those are uh, two hard things to kind of combat, you know, as far as the big corporate conglomerates, the Suntories, the Brown Foremans, all those type of things of the industry out there. D- do you guys work closely together with other distillers in, in, you know, Indiana or other craft distilleries throughout the U.S. to kind of feed ideas off of each other or things like that? Definitely. I have, I have definitely have other craft distillers that I'm close to. We talk with Alan Bishop down in, uh, French Lick, uh, you that, know, that guy's a maniac. Oh yeah. Yes, <laughs> he is. Oh, yeah. He's a great guy. Yes, he is. And, uh, you know, I, 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 what I think is cool is the personalities, you know, across the nation that I get to talk to where everybody has this cool story and they all kind of do one thing really well and you can learn from that one piece. And I love the individual stories across the board from everybody. And, uh, um, you know, I'm always kind of, this is, this is probably going to give me a little bit of trouble, but nah. you know, we'll walk into a room and, uh, I'll walk into a room and every, of other craft distillers and everybody is like on edge. You know what I mean? And I always, and once again, guys, I'm spoiled in that. Like, I don't see any of them as competition at all. Like, I will open my doors. I'll get them anything. I will help them in any way I possibly can because my competition is, you know, well, I mean, and, and to even compare, you know, is always going to be a Brown Foreman's Centauri. You know what I mean? Like uh, Sazerac, you know, all these big companies. And, and I can't compete against them. They're massive operations. You know what I mean? So to me, I, I really come to the table and say, listen, like, I'm not here to compete with any of you. If you need anything from me or my family, we'll break our backs to help you out because we think you're doing great stuff. Um, And and we want to do that, especially on the grain side. It's something that we sold dad on was uh, becoming like a grain source for craft distillers. And we just haven't really progressed that side of the business that much because we've been busy making bourbon like crazy. But it's something in the future that I think is uh, important and we want to do with people. Um, uh, It's, you know, I, I think... I love the personalities in the craft world. I think I love the personalities in the big brand worlds. They're fantastic. I love, I just love the industry as a whole. I think they're really good people. There's nothing, nobody's out to get anybody. It, it cracks me up when everybody kind of gets a little guarded and I'm like, guys, we're, we're all here trying to do the best thing. Like, and I always say that like competition wise, uh, uh, et cetera, it's really all about us making the best things we possibly can. And that's where, it, that's where it goes from there. So. Yeah, you said that, and there was a documentary that I watched not too long ago where they were talking about the, um, that's okay, um, when they talked about one of the um, distilleries that burnt down, I think Heaven Hill or somebody. Yeah. No, Heaven Hill bro- burnt down in 98, 99, and Beam gave them their, their still. And yeah. It's a great story. You know what and I mean? Like families. G- gave, like- them, gave them water i mean they, they gave yeah. them they gave them everything they needed to keep up and going and who would do that for a direct competitor i mean exactly. it, it, except in an industry which yep. you care more about the industry than you do necessarily your own product exactly i mean look at these personalities that we have um across the board the russells like you know these people are some of the greatest people i've ever met in my life you know i mean they're just fantastic and uh, i love it man i i love to always see the different people and like the you just said alan you know he's a maniac like Dude, that guy's a character. I mean, he's, he, but tell me who, 
name me another distiller that's on a sales trip to St. Louis goes into an old, you know, like uh, bear, uh, you know, beer aging cellar and propagates yeast like in his all the way home. You know what I mean? Like freaking awesome. You know what I mean? Like that. It's cool. So super cool. Love the personalities. So we were able to try, you know, a, a single barrel, your bottled and bond, um, and the American single malt whiskey. Um, so far, everything I've tasted has been pretty good. My favorite so far has been the Old 55 single barrel, and it's coming in at about 58.3 proof. Um, can you give us a little bit more as far as what do you look for when you're, you know, barreling your things or whenever you're getting ready to sell it out, the tasting notes that you prefer to have, and then what what does – Old 55 kind of bring tasting notes on uh, a general, you know, palate because you're, you, you are using the same mash bill. Absolutely. So uh, in, in, in that single barrel product, you know, that is a caramel vanilla bomb. I mean, that's just what it is. Very sweet. Um, just all kinds of awesome notes in there. Uh, we single barrel everything. Actually, every single one of our products, uh, we haven't released a product yet that isn't single barrel. Um, uh, and to do that is really about the the different changes in barrel entry proofs. And, you know, I mean, like, because the... The whiskey is, so people always ask me, like, well, well, what's the difference in your whiskey? And I don't think we have an answer yet. They'll, they'll ask me about barrel entry proofs, and we, we talked about this a little bit. 113 is roughly what most of our stuff went in, but we have stuff at 62.5 to, you know, 100. It's all, I mean, we're, we're still playing with because I think the answer is this, is there is no... I don't think that there is a sweet spot. I think the coolness is in all the different intricacies that you see. You know what I mean? So I always say our single barrels are 95% the same, and the magic is in that last 5% where it plays on, you know, exit entry, exit proof, all those things. So uh, to me, it's about the difference of, you know, uh, just carrying all these different uh, notes of, you know, uh, depending on the, the baking, so just these different tasting notes that you're going to catch across the board, and that that's what's fun to me. And I don't think I think we're young enough. We haven't. I don't have any one thing that that we're tracing. You know what I mean? Because I think the answer is that there's tons. You know, what I mean, you might you might want a 122 proof single barrel when you guys pick your first barrel, and then you come the next time you're like, what's your lowest one you got? Because we had the hottest one. You know, give, give me the lowest and let's try. It. Oh my gosh, is it, I don't. I don't think there's a single barrel we have that isn't delicious in its own way, but they are, there is some intricacies and differences. This is fun. You know? Right. I I personally, I I like the crazy high stuff. I mean, I've got a, I've got a GTS at home. That's 144.2 or 144.8, which is uh, exactly. Now I always say like any of that stag product, like, that's not for everybody, but right. I love it because there are flavors that exist. And, and I drink 160 off the still all day. Obviously, my palate's a little different than most people's, but I love to get into something like that because there are there are flavors that exist there that aren't somewhere else. But I could give that to the next, and you know, it could be some ridiculously expensive bottle of Stag. You know what I mean? Uh, hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollar bottle, and they would be like, "This is the grossest thing I've ever had," and I'd be like, it's "Sacrilege!" You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, burn them. You know, but like, it is to each their own. I think it is uh, what it is, and that's what we really try to uh, kind of proof these products at a pro, uh, at a price like so the new bottled and bond that just was released last last week that's a perfect example 100 proof ridiculously smooth i mean i think you guys can agree across the board all of my stuff especially for the proofs are insanely smooth you know so uh that's one thing that we can that we can uh bring to the the partaking public that is immediately perceived as uh what i want to say uh you know uh quality right you know i mean it it doesn't necessarily mean but uh, i'm with you i i mean i always say this uh bourbon and it's uh and i and i steal this word from uh michael veach so he gets full credit but uh you know bourbon in its very nature is ephemeral so it is the the four of us could crack a bottle open today of my barrel strength and you could all we could all agree it's the best bourbon we've ever had in our life and we're gonna say we drink half the bottle today and next saturday we're gonna get together we all drink we all eat taco bell right down the road and get together mm-hmm. and then we're like man this is still really good but it's not as good as i remember it being last saturday and that's bourbon that's bourbon man so i always say this drink we, lots we've of done bourbon. that a few times exactly drink lots of bourbon when you drink lots of bourbon you're gonna drink lots of crappy bourbon 
because there's more crappy than there is good and that's fine that makes you appreciate the good stuff better and then you know all i want to do and all my family is trying to do is make a bourbon that you say man you know, have you tried the new George T. Stag? Have you tried the new Weller? Have you tried all this new crazy cool stuff? Because I'm I'm a bourbon guy too. I want I don't drink all of it. You know, I'm, I'm constantly out looking for because I want to see what the industry is putting out. But what I want to do is I want you to say, man, but dude, I just cracked open that barrel strength from old 55 God, man jason and his family they're always bringing the heat man they're just bringing the best stuff they possibly can and that's what i want to be i want to be that that go-to where you know no matter what i release you're going to be like man i got to get a bottle because i know it's going to be good you know what i mean and that's what we're trying to do cool 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 so to me you're kind of in a in a mecca area of breweries Mm-hmm. Are there any special projects that you have in your mind? Or yeah, we have we like, have lots of. I actually just got asked about this earlier this week about barrel finishing products, and we don't have anything on on the calendar to finish anything at all. Um, but uh, the um, we do do a bunch of work with uh, um, breweries all over Indiana, Illinois. Uh, so they have bear, uh, beer aging in our barrels. Most of our barrels, uh, actually, no, that's not true. Absolutely, every single one of our barrels is spoking for for like eight months. Like they're huh. go, they're going to breweries. Uh, most of them are going to other distillers that want them for whiskey because they know what I'm pumping out, so they want that barrel to put the next thing in there. And uh, wineries, we we got some wineries, so we got some kind of cool stuff down the road, which I, I think will be uh, it'll be fun. Um, nothing really barrel finishing yet. I'm I'm a, still a purist in that, and I'm fighting that. Does that make sense? So to to no, your absolutely. question a little bit earlier is you, you know we're in Newtown, Indiana. And I'm making like bourbon bourbon. Does that make sense? Like that's what I want to be known for. So I, I don't really want to get crazy with, um, we, we've talked about this. I'm spoiled in that we, we have this ability to kind of have a timeline that is much longer than anybody else's because I, we're, we're self-funded. We don't have any investors. We can do whatever we need to do. And that is incredible. Um, but I want to be known for just making, I don't want to be known as the, the Indiana, the best Indiana bourbon i want to be known as the best bourbon period you know what i mean so like irregardless that's what i'm that's what i'm hunting for but what you have the competitive edge that you have over all your other people gives you the opportunity to be a little crazy if you want so you Absolutely. could go to scarlet line you could call elise and be like hey elise exactly you yep. put a good port in this in this bourbon barrel you give it back to me yep and then i'm going to age yep. it for six eight months you know four yep. weeks whatever the number is that until you get the taste that you like and then it gives you the opportunity to, to do that as a one. And if it turns out like crap, guess what? You don't have to exactly. sell it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, and we, we've had, got a, had a pretty good, you know, had a pretty good uh, track record of releasing nothing but expertly made stuff so far. And my issue with all of that is, man, like, I guess it's kind of the purest side of me. You're, you're right. You know, I do have the ability to do some weird stuff and the sweet corn is our weird stuff. That is one of those weird things. The single malt is a perfect example. That's, that's a hugely expensive. Nobody in North America has ever done a legit single malt with all North American ingredients, let alone sourced every single product and every part of that, that we smoked and malted it with in Indiana. It's a cool product. What did you guys try to think about? That's the last thing you guys had. You know, I, I thought it was good. Interesting, um, different, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, for me, it's just, it's different. It, yeah. it almost reminds you of that, uh, scotch without the peaty feel yeah you know so smokiness like okay so i hate super over peated scotches it's not my cup me of tea. too uh but this is so once again get to make everything you like so there's this undertone of smoke you know what i mean like underneath there but not overpowering and you just get all this intricacies that as you can taste all those different so very interesting so yes that is a good point we we do have the ability to make a lot of weird stuff but i guess i am kind of planting my flag in the ground and saying man i just want to make really good purest bourbon you know what i mean specifically weeders that's that's what interests me and uh you know yeah so so one of the things i just wanted to point out to everybody who may be listening to this is that we're in your your uh, current tasting room yep. in your lobby area and so there's going to be people coming in and out and that's okay i don't i don't mind. guys i appreciate it. yeah yeah, yeah. We, it's it's one of those things that i i don't i don't necessarily mind as long as everybody understands that's what we're, we're hearing in the, back in the background yeah, yeah but this this is a cool place. the 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 decor here is uh, perfect to come and do a tasting and do a tour. and And I've never seen any distillery like yours. I've certainly never seen a warehouse like yours. 
um, and then uh, where, you, where you're storing your barrels. I've, I mean, would you say it was an old cafeteria? Yep. So, I mean, th- this is a unique place to come. So, um, I, I, uh, I'm good. Um, I think it's going to be – you mentioned hundreds of people come through here on the weekends and stuff like that. It's, it's definitely a place to come and visit because it's, it's such a cool place to um, see something that you've never seen before. Nobody else has what you have back here. Well, and that's, what, that's what's fun to show off, and that is – you're exactly right. So, yeah, okay, so we just poured some corn whiskey. you got to try it. So um, White dog. Exactly, white dog, new age. So this is cut down to 80, Woo. but uh, try this and tell me what you guys think. This is, uh, this is the base of our weeded bourbon, and it is – if you've had – corn whiskey before um it is just it's usually pretty rough you know what i mean but mm. this is this is nice for what it is it is uh we've won a lot of gold medals for this it's it's been it, it's funny we have kind of a cult following on this product yeah. it's hilarious. no it's super sweet and super smooth um but man it's hot corn i mean oh yeah, like, yeah oh, it's, all <laughs> corn it's nothing but corn i actually can't find any of the, of the weed in this at all yeah. i can people will be like i was like i can drink a bottle of this and it, you can find anything it's in anything, almost but, like mellow corn like that taste of that really really super sweet Sweet without um, the aging from the barrel. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, yep. so you said you made a comment that everybody does at least one thing really, really well. What would you say was your all's one thing? Um, I think the one thing that we do that you can taste across any of our products is um, is and you could you could define it as a couple words, but like quality. Does that make sense? Like when you sip any of my spirits, you're like ooh. Like these guys, you know, I mean, you can drink spirits that you're just like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's all right. You know what I mean? Like that's a little rough. Not everybody can see your face, but that, that yeah, was great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, but the, the one thing that I say uh, that we do and my family does is we make impeccably well-made and well-distilled, you know, like um, some people say it's clean, like your stuff is so clean. And I'm like, yes, that's part of the distillation or it's so smooth. That's. Part. It's the same cleans. So all those things are all in the that distillation, that heart cut that we're taking the best thing, and that is that is to your question is the, is the is the marketing and and all of the things that, that that's the brand that we're trying to create is listen like you know yes it's fun to get a George T stag that's a hundred and forty foot this is awesome not everybody wants that you know what I mean um, uh, I would like to put a barrel outside in the sun and see how much I could overproof it. You know what I mean? And see if I can get up there just to see what it does with my stuff. But with that cleanliness and the, that, just that quality of spirit is what we're always getting. And that's what the equipment, that's what the corn is. What everything we're doing is lending to. Does that make sense? It's quality. It's all, I can't compete on, on, on quantity, you know, and we make a lot of bourbon. Don't get me wrong. I make a lot of bourbon for a craft distiller, but compared to Sazerac company or Brown form, I mean, it's hilarious. I can never catch up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they throw away more than you probably make every year. They spill more on the ground. You know what I mean? Than like what I make, you know, and I make thousands of barrels. You know what I mean? We do, we're, we are, I always say that like I am, I'm a weird distiller and then I'm a huge craft distiller, but compared to the big guys, like I'm not even a gnat on the wall. You know what I mean? So we're in this weird no man's land in the middle of nowhere that is like large production facility, like big still, you know, but like compared to those big guys and chasing that volume, like we we will never compete on volume. Does that make sense? It's always about quality. And I think that's the, to your question, that's what it is, quality. When did you sell your first bottle? And even before that, when did you take your first taste and think, dang, we got we got something here? Uh, well, I have a good story for the second one. The first bottle, I can't tell you. Uh, I want to say like 2000, 2016, 2015, late 2015. We had some straight bourbon that was out already. So, um, But to the point of knowing when we had something that was good, um, we went down – to the basement on before Thanksgiving. So it was my older brother, Chris, uh, my little brother, Aaron and I, and we go down the ramp that you guys went with and there's a uh, sweet corn right to the left, right there is our first batch of sweet corn we ever had. And I had been driving myself absolutely bananas, nuts, getting in the barrels like every day, like, Oh, is it good? And I finally had to stop. I was like, I'm literally not going to know, you know what I mean? I was just driving myself crazy. I got, I got to leave it alone. So I hadn't touched a barrel for almost eight months. I hadn't been in anything. I was just like, let it sit, leave it alone. I mean, I was popping bungs, getting in there. You know, when you borrow money 
and you know start a business with an inheritance you didn't know you had from the man you respect and love most on the planet like it's pretty important that you don't fail so i was i was a little bit going a little bit crazy but so i stopped so we hadn't been in anything for about eight months and my brothers and i we jump in we go down there i'm like hey let's go down and taste some stuff so we had some sweet corn that was like two months short of two years old and like i said i hadn't been in it for over you know, just under a year and we crack it open thief it pour it all out and i have this it's kind of like with movies we don't talk for like you know like five minutes you don't say anything immediate like you got to let everything you know process everything and we're sitting down there and i'm looking at my brother's faces and aaron's like who doesn't really drink bourbon you know what i mean he's he's not a big bourbon guy he will tell you that and he's like this, this ain't too bad you know i mean just i'm reading it on his face and my older brother who i love is like you know just looks like you know he just got his first transformer you know i mean he's just like <laughs> and i and i'm tasting this and i'm like oh wow this is really weird and different and it's really good and two thoughts ran through my head like first of all like we almost killed ourselves to make this first batch and we we're and we had already put this, the second batch was out of the field. I hadn't distilled it yet. I was like in the middle of distilling it right then. And it just, it's awful. I always tell people this. The reason nobody makes sweet corn bourbon is because we're the only ones dumb enough to make sweet corn bourbon. It's so stupid. The redneckery that goes into making that is, <laughs> the redneckery. is obnoxious, okay? So we're down there trying it. And I'm like, guys, what do you think? And Aaron's like, this, this is good. It's really nice, super smooth. And Chris is like, this, I've never had anything like this. This is good. And I'm like that was the moment if that makes sense to where i was like okay we're on to something like we're doing a good job this is good and uh then the fear struck and i looked over at my older brother and we have a funny story about this and i looked at my older brother because i don't have to worry about my little brother but my older brother i said if i catch you or any of your friends down here i will murder you <laughs> and he he chuckled and i was like i will murder you and we went back home and we found mom and i said mom if chris is missing for more than a day or two he's dead in the basement because i killed him He's not allowed down there. And to this day, I tease him. He's like, shut up, dude. Stop telling people that on podcast. But he kind of does ask permission. He can go down in the basement because <laughs> I will murder him. If he, that is my, Those are my babies down there. But, yeah, he. it's funny. But it is, uh, it is pretty funny because I can just see him down there like, oh, this is good. You got to try You know what I mean? Like he's just thieving away. Buddy. Yeah, just go to town. <laughs> no man. pun intended, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> That might be where that term came from. I don't know. So, yeah, so fine. Hey, I've got a couple more questions for you before we uh, get get off here and let you get into business. Oh, um, you're good. Number one, um, corn. You know, we're, we're in the mecca for corn, right? You know, Western yeah. Indiana, Illinois. You know, that type of area. Have you looked at any other varieties? Because you're already doing something a little odd, but like the Bloody Butchers or the Blue Mills, absolutely or any of those things. What, what what's the future hold for Old Fifty Five in that, in that so, aspect? So we played with a bunch of those. Um, uh, the Bloody Butchers, uh, Indian Corn. Uh, Alan has this really cool. I'm gonna butcher it. Um, it's the stuff he made. That's like a multi, almost like an Indian corn. It's got. Um, dang it. Uh, He's going to kill me when I, I shouldn't, but it's his variety that he grew and spliced. It's awesome. It looks gorgeous. Um, we played with all that stuff to be totally honest. It didn't, it didn't make the difference. We thought, you know, and the sweet corn was our totally unlike anything else. Does that make so that that was our product that we did that with. And then, um, but we do have some new, so uh, we can't disclose what it is yet, but off of the uh, traditional uh, family ground that is, um, uh, well, so there's two farms. The the farm that most of everything comes from now, uh, my grandfather bought in 92, I think. And then um, our centennial farm that we just got our 100-year uh, farming certificate for the Fruits family and Myers down in Alamo. Uh, we have some grain coming off of it this summer, uh, some blue corn, organic blue corn that is super cool. So so what fruits do you do? grow here no no fruits <laughs> just, just, just heirloom blue. grains you know no no uh, we do have some blueberries down there we, we always laugh we have some pretty big blueberry fields like uh that are along the fence row and i could i could probably get a batch or two through of that so yeah, yeah. they 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 said that that your your surname was derived from what your ancestors did for a living mm -hmm. so the smiths did smith work so, so i was assuming so there's a cool there's a cool so it was fruits it was german we're okay. german everyone in indiana like 80 percent is german they all all the german uh basically congregated into indiana there's a lot of really cool history there uh but there is some really cool history for my family so my uh it's five great grandpa 
George Fruits was, um, uh, so he was the, well, arguably, there's some people that argue against this, against this, but he was the last surviving veteran of the Revolutionary War. So he lived to be 107. Uh, he was a flag bearer. He wasn't, he wasn't necessarily conscien- uh, conscientious, conscientious objector, but he wouldn't carry a gun. So he was the flag bearer mm-hmm. for, in the Revolutionary Army, and he was six seven. They said so. The <laughs> average British like red so that coat flag was, like, was real. High. Yeah, I mean he was a gorilla. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so they would say he would just wade in on the charge and like break the lines, and like it's just this really cool. So with this blue corn, we have uh, uh, we 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 have some red, white, and blue corn down the matter, and we're gonna do like a flag bearer whiskey for him, like just to kind of as the family. There's some really cool That's stuff awesome. coming down the line, and it's just fun so yes there is some fun to that but to grow organic grains it takes years like all this is so much long play you know what i mean we have it's almost frustrating in that like not only does it take three years to grow it organically then we got to wait for it to be four years in a barrel before we can bond it and yeah it's just crazy in this technology age where we want everything now Now, right it's this is an industry that, that you can't do that with. No. no yeah, I think, I think Freddie Johnson kind of said it best, you know, um, even even your best distillers may not live to see their, their true third batch. Oh, yeah. You the know? best stuff come out and yeah. be blended off and exactly. Yep. No, that's it's a solid point, man. And we're always thinking about that. I'm thinking about legacy. Like, it makes me think about my little brother and his, his daughters, like, uh, of my sons. Like, who's going to be the next one to take up the mantle? You know what I mean? And You're going to have to build one of those family trees and, and, oh, yeah. and share all that information to, I love to make sure that everybody understands who's coming next. Oh, yeah. And it, even better, how cool it would be if they're all involved. You know what I mean? We mm-hmm. just better and bigger the business that way and let them go crazy. So it'd be fun. All right. Last thing. Um, <clears throat> brain went dead there for a second but uh that happens often <laughs> <laughs> tell us a uh, just um one more little bit about how you guys are going to you know kind of move forward you know what's the idea is what what's next for old 55 so that way you know we know what to look for absolutely well i think the the biggest thing we're doing moving forward was just released last week and it's what i've been looking you know, the most Ford for almost seven years is a bonded product. You know, I mean, nobody's going there in the industry because it's hard to do. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't lie and make bonded product. Um, so that is where I see us pushing in the immediate future is getting that out, getting it out in hands and, and letting people, you know, you'll see on a bunch of our social media, we're, we're tagging, where's your bourbon from? And you know, there's nothing wrong with sourced whiskey. Like I don't want to say that at all. Like it's delicious. Like, you know, there, there's but, a lot from Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of Kentucky bourbon being made. I, I can't tell you the amount of that's being made down there, you know, but I say, I say this like, you know, and there's nothing wrong with those products and there's nothing wrong with that set of the industry. Like the whiskeys are good. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm disparaging them in any way, shape or form. What I want to say is, what about that customer and what my family wants to do is, what about that customer that wants to get on Google Maps and can see the sweet corn field, the field where this, like, that's what we do. We are 100% transparent from, you know, from seed to bottle. Me or one of my family members are going to do all of it, and that's what we want to do. So, One one last thing, and I'm sorry, I said the last one was the last you're, one. You're, but you're good. So like, the, the last before the last. The last before the last, right. Um you mentioned because you guys are doing something a little different. You guys are using a 30 gallon mm-hmm. um, barrel versus, you know, what most people are using in that 53. Um, do you have an age that you're just trying to get to, to where you've got to, cause you know, some people are like, Oh man, that 10 or the 12, you know, there's some 15s and some 20s and 23s that people talk a lot about. Oh yeah. Um, at what point do you think you're going to be like, Hey, I, I can't let this go any further because of the smaller barrel and, and how fast the Oak protrudes into that product. I think we're I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I think we're getting closer because of that thirty gallon barrel. It's sooner than most people have to deal with it. Um, to me, I want the product to speak for itself, and then also like, you know, the the big thing to me is is that is the single barrel. That's why you see single barrel on every single one of our labels. When you take a sip of anything brown from Old Fifty Five, it came from one individual cask. Period. Um, we actually haven't released a non-aged, uh, the corn whiskey is obviously not single barreled. It never was in a barrel, but it's from one distillation. Uh, every single one of our other products is all single barreled. And what I say is, you know, um, there's a reason you don't see 12 and 15 year old single barrel products that everybody are chasing. I think there's some misnomers there. You know what I mean? And I want to, 
I'm with you. I want to see how far we can stretch it and see what we can do. You know what I mean? But I think we're getting pretty darn close to where, um, you know, my product speaks for itself. I mean, that's what I'm most proud of is in, and proud of the family is, you know, I, I think our bourbons stand on their own two legs and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So if people want to reach you, they want to, they want to come in and they want to talk to Jason fruits and the family and everything else, how do they get in touch with you or to find out a little bit more about old 55? Absolutely. So old 55 distillery.com kind of tells a little bit about the story. Um, we're in Newtown, Indiana. We're open for tours usually when it's not this COVID craziness, uh, noon to eight o'clock on, uh, Friday and Saturday, noon to six on Sundays. Right now it's just noon to 6 PM Friday and Saturdays due to Indiana rules for model sales. And we don't want to push it and keep everybody healthy. And, uh, we're, we're trust me itching to get back open. That'll be awesome. But tours tasting cocktails here and then on social media we're pretty active on there so uh, instagram uh um facebook old 55 distillery all underneath there like us share us follow us see where we're at um coming around hopefully we get to do some more with you guys you guys come out we have a huge barbecue fest in august you guys need to come out and yeah. love to treat you it's awesome so so if you want to reach us at bourbon barrel talk you can hit us up on facebook instagram and twitter or you can email us at bourbonbarreltalk at gmail.com. This is Scott Minton, Toby Hatfield, Dave Mole, and Jason Fruit signing off.